there's a slight discrepancy between the printed and website ecoop schedules versus the carry on schedules. Uh, so the carry on schedules show this as being uh, are we ready for secure languages? Just making sure everybody's in the right room, going to the right places. So, okay, great. Sounds perfect. ready for secure languages. I'm Cristina Cifuentes from Oracle Labs, and before I give this talk, I have to tell you that everything that I've mentioned today here is just ideas, okay, and they're my own. <laughs> so, for the past nine years, I've been working on static code analysis tools, being able to scale up analysis, run over um, millions of lines of code, and be able to deploy all of these analysis internally. Now, this talk is really a reflection of the type of vulnerability spots that we've been seeing in the code bases for the past nine years. Okay, so all of you are familiar with the heartbleed bug, and at the core of it, what did we have? A buffer overflow. Many of you are familiar with this very old cartoon, SQL injections, to date it still happens, but it's not just only SQL injections, it's all sorts of different type of injection attacks. We also have a lot of permissions, privileges, and access control type of issues happening in our code bases. And there's one new trend that has started happening in the past few years, and this one relates to cryptography. And this code here sometimes is almost like the code that you find in some production systems, okay? <laughs> So the reality is that for the past three years, looking at the data that comes from the National Vulnerability Database, you find that there have been 2,477 buffer overflows over three years, right? If you think about that number, that's quite large, right? And so we have in the order of more than two buffer overflows being reported as a vulnerability on a daily basis for the past three years. You look at cross-site scripting attacks, there have been 2,230 in the past three years. Again, in the order of two per day. 1,793 access control type of issues. So now we're in the order of 1.6 per day. And cryptography, because this one's new. This one didn't used to happen 10, five years ago. And in the past three years, it has grown quite a bit. And now we have 1,769 vulnerabilities in the cryptographic area, right? And when you think about cryptography, and when, what you were taught at university, they were telling you very simple things like don't use hard-coded passwords, right? And back then when I studied, they were teaching us about the death algorithm. And we all know that the death algorithm is not secure these days, right? When you go and look at the National Vulnerability Database, what is the root cause of some of these cryptographic issues, you find hard-coded passwords. You find use of deprecated algorithms. Today, you have new code that is being developed making use of MD5. And the developers that are writing the code don't actually know that that's not a safe algorithm to use. Okay? You have use of wrong defaults, you have hard-coded uh, seeds and so on. And I like this last one. On a cloud platform, having valid users and host security keys being left on the image that gets deployed on the cloud platform. These all come from the National Vulnerability Database, uh, 
nothing from our internal code bases, okay? And so the point is that a lot of these vulnerabilities that are happening, buffer overflows, SQL injections, cross-site scripting, they're well known. They have been well known for more than 25 years, right? Buffer overflows has been exploited since 1988 with the Morris worm. And you're like, that was more than 25 years ago. Why is it that we still have so many buffer overflows being exploited? You have cross-site scripting SQL injection attacks that happened in the wild in the nine, late 1990s. And they were pretty well documented in the literature. And still today, these are the two most common type of injection attacks. So I'm focusing on these four different types of vulnerabilities because when you look at the data from the National Vulnerability Database, you find that they're the top four vulnerabilities that we're seeing in today's software as reported vulnerabilities, okay? We're not talking about all the other ones that don't get reported. So you start thinking, why is this possible? How is this happening, okay? And if we look at the first three vulnerabilities, cryptographic issues are a little bit different because from the flavor of, of the examples that I gave you, it's clearly something that is happening because people don't seem to be very familiar with the use of cryptography. However, when you look at the general data and you start looking at 20 years ago, 20 years ago there were only 25 vulnerabilities reported in the whole year. And now, last year, we have over 6,000 vulnerabilities reported. And these are only the reported ones, but also when you have a vulnerability that is reported, it's being exploited in many different places, right? So it's not a one-to-one -one mapping. We have one-to-n places where they get exploited. And even worse, not everyone upgrades their software. So on a year-by-year -year basis, vulnerabilities that happened in earlier years are still being exploited today. Okay. And these vulnerabilities are happening in today's common languages, right? Happening in Java, C, C++, Python, JavaScript, you name it. They're affecting all of the software that we're making use of. Software that runs on your web browser, data that gets stored into your database, your mobile phones, critical infrastructure throughout the world, as we saw with OpenSSL, but also the cloud infrastructures. And when you try and think about the economic effect that this is happen happening, you end up with data like this one, where the average cost of a data breach is $4 million. That's using an average of 10,000 records being stolen, right? And that just gives you an idea. That's only one particular data breach, right? So think of it as one vulnerability, one exploit, one of the N exploits that happen because one vulnerability, okay, in the code. And so now we start thinking about why is this happening, right? We have this big difference between how hackers think, because they're looking for those security bugs, and the way that developers think whereby you're always looking into what are the new features that you're developing in the software, right? And the reality is that when hackers look at the code, they're always looking at the code from the point of view of how do I break into this system, right? Whereas when developers write all of the new code, they're looking into the functionality. What are the requirements? What is it that I need to implement, right? And as developers, we have never gain an intuition as to how to hack our own systems, right? And I've seen this several times where an ethical hacking team comes and reports on new features in a particular system, and the developer that implemented some of those new features stands up and says, I implemented that feature, it's correct, according to the requirements. And the ethical hacker says, yes, but I'm telling you how we would exploit it, how anyone else would exploit it, right? And so there's this lack of intuition really happening, but it's because of how we think about bugs and features, okay? 
Now, when you talk to ethical hacking teams, hackers in general, and you ask them, what are sample attack techniques? What do you do for these four different areas? With buffer errors, there's a variety of different ways of how to exploit buffer overflows. And they're pretty well documented to the point that these days there's even automated tools to generate some of these exploits, right? For injections, you find that normally they're going to look for missing sanitizations that ought to be happening in the code base. Or they're going to look for validation sanitizations that are making use of the wrong context, right? Like sanitizing SQL with HTML or sanitizing JavaScript with HTML and vice versa, right? For access control type of issues, you're normally looking for those permissions. Are there missing permission checks in place? And you're also looking for incorrect checks, right? Like if you're talking about database code, you may be looking for um, is the administrator logged in instead of is the user logged in, right? In the code, right? And then for cryptographic issues, when I went to ask them what is happening in that area, they say, well, we just look for like the most basic type of things. Weak defaults, use of weak defaults. Weaknesses in protocols, use of deprecated algorithms, right? So the threshold is very, very low, like from their point of view, and they can always find a lot of issues in the system. So then why is this happening? So when we think about like this three, uh, top three type of uh, vulnerabilities, buffer errors, injections, and access control. Abstracting these issues, we basically end up with user input, hence untrusted input, accessing a security sensitive access in your code, right? So in the case of a buffer overflow, let's say in a multi-tenant system, if the overflow is going to end up corrupting some memory, so you're going to access, not corrupting, but you're going to end up accessing memory from, let's say, a different tenant, that's a big issue. That's a security concern, right? No one wants like their data to be accessed by a different system, right? Same with injections, same with access control, right? And the reality is that whenever uh, you have untrusted input, you need to sanitize your inputs, right? But the main problem that we're seeing is that sanitization is left to the developer. It's the developer's responsibility to actually do something about sanitization. Because most languages do not provide sanitization support in the language. So then you as a developer need to ensure that you add the right sanitization and that you are aware of the fact that you need to sanitize the data along all paths to any possible security sensitive access in the program, okay? And you start thinking about solutions. What about education, right? The reality is that many programming languages subjects, they don't cover security as part of the subject. And there are very few universities where they offer a programming language security course at the undergraduate level. We need to be training at the undergraduate level, not only at the postgraduate level, in terms of security. And so hence, this leads to companies having to have their own training on programming language security so that developers become more aware of the vulnerabilities that are happening in the code so that they don't have those type of errors. But overall, given the type of vulnerabilities that people are exploiting today, it's clear that Education is not working, okay? And that leads you to think, is there a problem with the cognitive load that we're introducing in our programming languages, right? Why is it that buffer overflows are still happening? People don't get it with pointers. That's a reality, right? Some people do, but the majority don't. We look at other solutions. I mean, I've been working in this area, static code analysis solutions. And you think like what a static code analysis tool is doing is redoing half of what the par a compiler is doing, right? You're reparsing, you're 
doing your encoding of the semantics, you're creating another intermediate presentation, and then you're actually doing the analysis, right? And your analysis is going to be an over-approximation or under-approximation of the program, hence you end up with false positives or false negatives in whatever you report. You always end up also with um, a high rate of true positives, depending on your analysis. But then we all know that a static code analysis tool is going to provide you with an incomplete solution. It's never going to be able to find all of the bugs and vulnerabilities that exist in your code base, right? So we look at two other solutions. Dynamic solutions. Um, with dynamic analysis tools, you're always going to be covering the particular paths that are being run for a particular data set, and hence you're going to do incomplete solution as well. Only those paths are the ones that are being exercised. And Faxing Solution is going to try and generate for you automatically data inputs that are going to crash your program. So superb, but again, it's an incomplete solution. It's only along the paths that we're traversing. And with verification solutions, they have improved quite a bit in the past years. Right? You have model checking, theory improving. However, they don't scale to the size of large code bases, industrial code bases that are being used in today's world. Right? So then you really start thinking, you have had solutions like study code analysis tools that can find a lot of these type of bugs and security issues in the code. Why is it that we're not integrating these concepts into our programming languages? Okay. You could integrate into the compiler, that's one way. Okay. But you could also use a different approach and is integrate into your design of your next programming language how to solve some of these issues statically so that the developer doesn't have to even worry about them. Here's an awesome language, right, that has actually started thinking about how do we get rid of these buffer errors statically, okay? And what I like the most is they're trying to provide all of these memory safety guarantees by the fact of introducing two new concepts, right? So you as a developer need to know two new concepts, but you're going, going to get memory safety guarantees, which is so much better than compared to languages like C, okay? So you have the concept of ownership, whereby you're going to own these pointers, and you have the concept of borrowing, whereby you're going to lend this particular value for a limited period of time, but it's still being owned by someone else, right? And you're going to ensure that with borrowing, you don't have shared borrowing, hence aliases, and mutable borrowing at happening at the same time, okay? So two new concepts, you get used to them, and then you start coding in these languages, and you can write even like garbage collectors, like um, Steve Blackburn and Tony Hoskin have done at ANU. And it's well performant, memory safe, it's also data race free by design in this language, right? And it performs really well. So superb, you know. Here's like one way of thinking about how to start changing the way that the language is designed so that developers have better constructs to be able to do their work. Okay? But we also know that we could design some of these languages with solutions that are provided to you dynamically, right? or that we could extend some of the languages. So here's an example of a proposal on how to extend the C language to be able to deal with um, getting rid of um, buffer overflows. Right? So, this is work by David Tarditi, it's version 0.5 at the moment. It's a, a proposal, the plan is to integrate it into a version of Clang. But the idea here is that you can extend the C language with bounce checking, and they propose three different types of pointers, okay? So now you're going to have the PTR, which is a pointer that you would use when you're not doing pointer arithmetic. You're going to have array PTR, which is used when you're doing pointer arithmetic, and these can be tracked statically, right? And you're going to have span, which is a pointer that is going to keep track of the bounds, carry it with the pointer itself, and it's going to be checked dynamically. 
right? But you can see also in this proposal that there's a lot of other extensions that are being proposed, right? As well as some dynamic checks for those cases that do not fit into these three new type of pointers, all right? And there's where you, we start ha to have to think about cognitive load, okay? What is going to be simpler for the developer, right? A solution that has two new type of pointers, like concepts, a solution where the developer has to really start keeping track of a lot more data. Now, how have a lot of the managed languages dealt up with buffer errors and a lot of these other uh, memory-related type of issues? Well, they're doing this through garbage collection, a concept that was first introduced in the Lisp language, concept that has really been embraced by the programming language community, right? A lot of object-oriented languages, functional languages, dynamic languages are widely using this technique, right? However, this technique doesn't always work well when you have um, code that needs to be very low level, right? When you need systems level code bases, people that really care about performance also in the embedded systems, they start making the trade-offs, well, I can't afford managed language, I need some other type of solution, right? So some of these solutions need to vary depending on the type of application that you're trying to target. Now, what about injection attacks? In Perl 3, there was the introduction of the taint mode. And with taint mode, this was the first language that actually did something about let's track all of these user inputs, their tainted inputs. Let's track them and actually let the application know about it. And they use two different modes. There's one mode whereby everything is done automatically for you when you have like a, a, a different uh, UID and the group ID that is running the process, then when they're different, automatically will track it for you. But you can also turn it on, let's say that you're going to run a server application, you can turn it on with the dash T option and it's going to track for you tainted data. Um, very good concept, it works well in practice, hasn't been yet been introduced to Perl 6. Um, because yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, you know, one of the only languages that has actually looked into how to look at injection attacks, right? And Ruby has been like the one other language that has picked up this idea. Now, what about access control type of support in our languages? I know there's a variety of different types of access control. And I'm going to focus more from the point of view of the Java vulnerabilities, because I'm very familiar with these ones. We've been working in this area for the past three years. What was the root cause of a lot of these zero-day attacks that happened in the late 20, um, 2012, early 2013? You would have remembered lots of exploitation against the Java platform zero-day attacks happening almost like on a weekly basis. And the reality was, when you started looking into the issues, what were the issues? They were all access control type of issues. So they related to the fact that you need to have permissions, you need to have sanitization, <coughs> and you're accessing privileged code. And in the case of a system like the JDK, you have, um, color sensitive methods, you also have to privilege code, okay? And a lot of these issues were really just getting to those security sensitive type of methods in such a way that even though the goal of the language, the Java language was to be able to safely run untrusted code in the form of applets, all of these attacks were being able to get out of the sandbox. Right? And they were being able to run with high privilege and then do whatever they wanted, you know, with the rest of the code, right? Now, the security model was introduced a long, long time ago, 1998. Uh, this was introduced in Java 1.2. And the model, you know, subscribes to the principle of least privilege, right? And what they do in the Java security model is that there's the concept of the security manager. The security manager is always going to do all of the checks that relate to access control. But in essence, 
what they're checking, uh, what they have implemented is a stack-based model, and they're going to check every single invocation frame to determine if all of the frames have the same permission when you're wanting to access a piece of code that is security sensitive, okay? Now, the idea was very novel uh, back then, given the amount of exports that have happened, like, there needs to be changes, right, in the system. Now, here's a different way at looking at access control, and this is work by Mark Miller and the Kaha plugin for JavaScript. I mean, again, superb type of idea, and it's how to integrate it into an existing language, JavaScript, a language that is not providing this type of guarantees for you, right? And so what are the goals? Like the goals here in this case is to extend and also limit the JavaScript language to be able to safely embed untrusted content, untrusted applications running on a web browser, right? And he has lots of demos, you can go and run them and so on. But it's exactly the same type of idea that the Java system wanted to have through the use of applets, right? Now the implementation here is very different. The implementation that Mark is using is that of object capabilities, right? And with his object capabilities, what he's done is that he's created like this capability secure version of JavaScript that is called SES. And then he also has a way of having a safe DOM wrapper as well as having CSS and HTML sanitizers. And so the combined package gives you all of these access controls any of the vulnerabilities that have been reported against Kaha have not related to access control. They have, there have been a few, but they've related to, there was a wrong implementation here and there in terms of how the compiler was getting rid of dead code, right? So, superb idea, different way about how to think about access control, seems to be working really well. Oh, and Mark is proposing this um, to, to, to the JavaScript um, committee, okay? Now, in terms of cryptography, okay, that's the new kid on the block, right? A lot of these vulnerabilities that are happening, happening purely through use of cryptographic APIs. And many languages provide access to cryptographic APIs these days. Uh, Java was perhaps one of the first languages that introduced this concept right, through the cryptographic uh, architecture back in Java 1.1. And it's basically providing a framework for cryptography for you. You're able to have APIs for encryption, for key generation, for management of your keys, and so on, right? And then a lot of the new languages are also providing their own cryptographic API support, right? Why? Because it's clearly needed in today's distributed computing world, in today's cloud world, right? Now, if you think back at the examples that I gave you of the type of cryptographic issues that are being exploited, you really have to conclude that the cryptographic APIs that we're making available today are too low level for the common developer to be able to understand how to use them. Okay. So it's the analogy to pointers are too low level for many developers to be able to use them correctly. We need to have better abstractions to be able to have better security in the cryptographic area. All of the issues were through bad use of existing cryptographic APIs, okay? These days, the type of errors that you see in the cryptography area are not because you, as a developer, decided that you could develop a better cryptographic algorithm. No, that's not happening anymore. It's because we're using crypto APIs incorrectly, okay? So if we put all of that together, we basically end up with these four different bubbles, and I've removed the Java language just to focus on the newer languages here, okay? And with these newer languages, what you see is a cluster, right? In that there's a lot of emphasis that has been put into the memory safety area through uh, static dynamic type of techniques or proposals for extensions to um, the C language, okay? You have languages like Perl 
that they have focused on the memory safety as well as how to get rid of these injection type of attacks. You have languages like Ruby that have looked into injection, they have looked into cryptography, and because I didn't build this diagram correctly, Ruby also is here in the memory safety. So they actually have looked into three of the four different areas that I'm talking about today. But what you do not see here today is any language that is at the core, any language that is actually capable of being able to focus on those four different areas and provide solutions to the developers. Okay. So why did I focus on these four different issues? Not only because they're the top four, but also because when you look at the higher level categories that are used in the National Vulnerability Database, their categories relate to data handling, security features, poor code quality, and time and state. When you do the combination of buffer errors, injections, access control, and cryptographic issues, you find that 76% of all of the issues that are happening are really in the, those areas. 76% okay? of all of the issues, all of the vulnerabilities for the past three years are purely due, due to these four different types of vulnerabilities. Okay? Now, this area here of poor code quality really relates to resource management, so, so things like use after free and double freeze, but it also could be like uh, worker termination errors, right? Some languages do support that through um, some parts of that through memory safety, and other languages don't, right? And this 1% here, time and state, that really relates to concurrency, data races, and due to Limited time, I cannot actually go through some of the examples, but in the concurrency area, there have only been 149 vulnerabilities be, being reported in the past four years. But there's been a lot of activity in that area in recent years in terms of programming languages, right? You have Go, you have Tony, you have closure also, looking into all of these areas, right? Concurrency, embracing concurrency at the heart. It's part of the future. Not a lot of vulnerabilities happening today, but maybe in the future, more vulnerabilities will be happening in that area, unless we start thinking of different ways as to how we can provide more concurrent, safe type of languages for developers to use on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, so, what am I going to summarize in terms of what is security in terms of the programming languages? If you can provide safety in your languages either by providing the safety in the language itself or by providing it through libraries. Okay? I argue that the more we can do in the language, the better, because many times some of the libraries are, are an afterthought. So much better if we can embed it into the language. It's at the core of it. Clearly, we need to have trade-offs in terms of performance, the static solutions, dynamic solutions. It could be a combination of both. And there's a lot more accesses to this, depending on where you're going to use your languages, right? There have been 14,844 vulnerabilities in the past 10 years. Think about that. That's more than 10 per day. That's a ridiculous high number, okay? Happening in our common languages. And education is lagging. And so it's clearly time to start including security in our language design. And of course, there's going to be barriers to adoption, right? Performance is one of the most common ones that gets mentioned uh, in many communities. But there's a lot of usability type of issues as well that need to be addressed. We need to be removing any cognitive overload. We need to make languages simpler so that every single developer can use these languages correctly. We also need to be able to look into usability of the tooling for any new language, right? If we can integrate solutions into familiar tooling, so much the better, right? Everyone will feel comfortable. They can actually make use of tooling rather than 
new language, I don't have a good way of debugging this new language. And of course, we also need to think about how would we interface to legacy languages because the reality is it's a lot of legacy code around the place, right? So here's some challenges. First challenge, can we design a language that just eradicates these four different types of vulnerabilities, buffer errors, injection attacks, access control type of issues, and cryptographic issues. Here's another challenge. Can we provide the context for tainted data when you're crossing across different layers? So imagine you have an application, this application ends up tracking some tainted data, storing it in a database, some other piece of code later on comes and uses this data from the database, how does it know it was tainted? What about high-level cryptographic APIs? And how do we define and design these high-level crypto APIs so that 20 years from now, they're still in use rather than we need to change them every two or three years, right? <coughs> and in general, how do we provide security guarantees in our languages? The reality is our languages do not provide security guarantees, right? So with 18.5 million developers writing code throughout the world, 40% of them being hobbyists. So not everyone, of course, is going through a computer science degree. Many people pick up these languages, they write code, they contribute towards everything um, that is available in today's world. We need to ensure that security is not just for experts anymore. And we cannot keep calm and carry on programming. It's time to make a change. We need security for the masses. Thank you. Um, hello. Um, first of all, thank you for the talk. Um, I ended up in programming language design after I read about how to exploit buffer overflows in FRAG in the late 90s. So uh, it's uh, right in my area. So um, a lot of the points you brought up um, are, are right, are correct, are very, very good. The fact that we still see memory corruption issues is a shame for the industry, totally. Um, but there's one nit I'd like to pick, and that is with the um, injection prevention. So um, uh, it is a common myth that sanitizing your inputs helps against injection attacks. It does not because you do not know at input time where the data will end up at. Like Mr. O'Hara, um, working for AT&T, born on January 1st, 1970. Um, what do you want to sanitize there? Do you want to change its name? No, that, that can't work. So we, we cannot um, sanitize inputs. We need to make sure that at output time, we're correctly treating um, our data. Okay. Um, very important distinction. Many people get that wrong. And the output has a context. And we need to um, uh, escape the outputs depending on the context we're outputting at. And um, this is also why I think that taint tracking won't help as much, because we need to assume that all data comes from somewhere. And um, we no longer have batch processing. We have input, processing, output. We have complex systems that interact. Mm -hmm. So tent tracking, it was a good idea back then, but I think we need something else today. And um, one idea is to use type systems um, to prevent people from just stuffing any old string in any old output. So you can use a type system to force the user to call the right sort of escaping function on a string to prevent an injection attack. I think that's something that I would like to suggest on top of your um, suggestions on where to go with programming languages. And um, what we can also do is make it very, very hard 
for people to get it wrong. An example is there are lots of templating libraries for HTML. Some of them just automatically escape by analyzing um, your template, by analyzing the grammar of the file and just calling the right escaping for you. This is what prevents um, injection text in such a case. It's uh, n nothing else ever will that the programmer needs to do manually and I'm very, very glad that you brought up the point we cannot train people to do it right. We need to ensure that it's secure by default on the language and in a uh, library. Thank you. Great, yeah, and uh, on your point on painting, I mean, I wasn't suggesting that's like the only way to do it, that we need to be thinking about other ways how to do it, right? And, you know, like you can even go like beyond the programming language and you can start thinking about like, should the operating system be tracking some of these? Could we do some of it at the hardware level, right? Like if we had like one extra bit, is it worthwhile? Is it going to work? We don't know, but we need to start looking into all of these different ways of doing things. Hi, thank you for the very nice talk. Um, I agree that the languages should provide more security guarantees, but I'm wondering that uh, what do you think in the meantime we can do to train our students and <laughs> developers better to kind of bridge the gap until maybe finally we reach these languages that have, you know, the guarantees for us. Well, how, can we, how can we improve our education? Yeah, I, I think at the moment, well, well like say, say like for students that are going through a computer science degree, what we normally see is that security is not mentioned in the undergraduate degree, right? It's not mentioned from the point of view of vulnerabilities. There's like computer security in general, but not vulnerabilities that may happen in the code, right? And so many students don't actually have the concept as to what are some of these vulnerabilities. I think buffer overflows, er everyone is familiar with that, if they actually had to write in the C or C++ language, right? But beyond that, many students don't have an idea of this. And I mean, like, it's very simple to integrate some of these concepts into an undergraduate course, right? So what you're saying is that the first thing we need to improve is on awareness, right? That the students are aware of That's these right, vulnerabilities. That's right, because they're not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, like, when, when people go to industry and they say, like, in several companies, they have their own training for how to write code correctly and so on, you kind of wonder, like, wh why so late, right? Like, they should already be coming to industry actually knowing about this. About access control, hi, over here, hi. About access control, you're pretty negative on the old Java stack frame thing and pretty positive on secure ECMAScript. And it, are capabilities the only answer here? No, or so is there something else? No, 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 L like what happens is that there they are two very different ways of how, how to implement it, right? And with, with the Java security model, I think we have seen a lot of issues happening in that area in terms of its access control support. Uh, with this object capability model, we're not seeing those issues happening, right? Of course, like the model hasn't been around for as long and so on, one could argue. But if you look at Java 9, Java 9 implements modules, right? And with Java 9, you have a concept of how to implement capabilities through the modules, right? And in practice, what we see is that that actually makes a big difference in terms of the vulnerabilities that you see in the code, right? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the question of the, um, yeah, the question that, that was posed in the title was uh, actually not answered. And uh, so we need security for the masses. But uh, are we ready for that, or do you think so, or not? I, th I think we are ready. I gave you examples of different languages that have looked at different aspects of the problem from different points of view, right? And with a lot of these languages, like you, wh what I found interesting was that they would say, and our language aims to be safe. But then safe for the language meant it's going to be memory safe, or it's going to be data free safe, or it's going to be something safe, but it was not like this bigger picture of, of safeness, more comprehensive safeness, right? And I think like we are ready, we need to put also more investment in terms of how to do it like more comprehensively 
so that we start seeing what is the end effect, right, on usability for the developers. Do you, do you see any problems like in uh, unlocking the golden middle of the intersection? Pardon? Do you see any, uh, any issues, for example, like uh, implementation-wise or like uh, usability-wise for unlocking the intersection in the diagram? that you showed, for example, in all these different kinds of safety? Yeah, I, I don't think like, like there's an implementation uh, problem with it. It's going to be more like what are the right abstractions that we need to use so that those abstractions are really easy for developers to use rather than we're going to get them to yet learn more and more complicated concepts that are not going to help, right? So I think like the core is going to be what are the abstractions that we need to be able to have in our languages so that we end up with everything at the core. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Let's thank the speaker.